great. <laughs> well, thinking of uh, science for the global good, uh, there's a lot to be optimistic about. And if we look at why is, is life better today than 100 years ago, uh, science has played such a major role in that. And infectious disease everywhere in the world is less of a burden, substantially less of a burden, uh, than it was everywhere in the world 100 years ago. We also have the incredible piece of discovery, uh, the genome inf information, the information technology systems that let us communicate and, and get collaborations that wouldn't have been possible before. And so you have all these great things that should be benefiting uh, everybody on the planet. And yet if we look at how those things are being made available uh, to the world at large, to the so-called developing world, which is a funny term, you know, what it means is most the people. Uh, you know, the developed world, that's the unusual exception, uh, just over a billion uh, people. The majority by far is, uh, you know, close to uh, five billion of the, the six billion that aren't yet really seeing the impact of these, these new science advances. You know, thinking of it even in, in political terms, in the previous panel I talked about hard power and soft power, and the idea that is, are the richer countries, uh, particularly the U.S., mapping these advances to show the world at large uh, that, you know, things really are getting a lot better, the, the opportunities will be uh, more equalized in the future than they are today. I'd have to say, you know, I, I think we're falling short. I mean, there are many things we do, but uh, there's kind of this market failure to take this science and map it into creation of drugs. And e even though the U.S. does many good things, I think, you know, we run the risk of resentment if we don't uh, include this better transfer of science mapping the problems of the developing world into our soft power portfolio. One uh, initiative that the, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is taking is... Uh, creating what we call the, the grand challenges in global health. And this will assemble a lot of top scientists from around the world to actually write down what are the things that like uh, preventing mosquitoes from being a vector for malaria and other diseases or getting vaccines out without having to keep them in cold all along the way, which that's a huge problem. If, if vaccines could be delivered without having to stay cold, the ability to get coverage and new vaccines and would be night and day. So the idea is to write down some challenges, almost like uh, Hilbert did in the field of mathematics in uh, 1900, that sort of got all the young brains thinking, okay, if I can solve that problem, you know, I'm, I'm really making a huge contribution. And it drew in people even uh, uh, from outside mathematics who thought they could do these things. Well, here it's, it's not just biologists we want to challenge, you know, people who understand packaging technologies or nanotechnologies might be the people who combine up with biologists uh, to, to get these things done. So, you know, a lot more can do, I hope, this grand challenge thing, which is just a start. It's a $200 million uh, dollar grant will help, help drive that forward. And I hope, also hope that some kind of consensus about overseas development aid uh, and needing to be more generous on that can emerge. The best thing that, if you, if you talk about really poor countries, uh, the idea that bringing rich two-way communications should be a high priority there, you know, that just doesn't bear out in reality. Uh, if you want to get the population growth down, if you want to get the uh, sustainability of agricultural development that leads to other things, you've got to improve health. Health is the leading indicator for lowering, lowering the population growth. and getting the agricultural surplus that leads to all other things. I think science does have a lot to offer, but I think I would agree uh, with Bruce that business as usual is not going to be the way to get this done. Now, we are, after all, enjoying uh, in the scientific world a remarkable revolution in capabilities. Genomics is perhaps the most visible part of that revolution, but there are other uh, attached revolutions to it that are also happening uh, simultaneously that empower us to unravel problems that previously were just outside of our grasp. After all, we now have the complete 
DNA sequence of our own instruction book, the human genome, sitting in public databases. It has been in a draft form for the last two years. It will be finished in this coming April. It will be there for everybody in the world who has a good idea to try to figure out how to use it. And I might say one of the nice things about this uh, immediate accessibility of this information and much other information associated with genomics is it really does level the field. Wherever you are in the world, uh, if you have the capabilities of looking at the information and trying to sort through it uh, computationally, you have equal access to everybody else. The trend very much now is to recognize uh, that a lot of very basic information, uh, particularly genomic information, uh, is best serving the scientific community and the world at large if it's placed in the public domain. And I can cite you several examples of public-private partnerships where the private sector has put their own funds into such efforts with the understanding that the information would be placed in public databases with absolutely no restrictions on its use. So I think we are seeing a shifting away from an unfortunate trend that perhaps was dominating the scene a decade or even five years ago towards a recognition that basic science information ought to be out there for anybody with a good idea to begin to use it. And I would like to say that I think the international flavor that has characterized the Human Genome Project, which was, after all, carried out by six countries uh, and 20 different laboratories and very much believed uh, in the importance of that kind of wide accessibility has played some role in, in changing the dynamics in the favor of openness. That is another issue we have to discuss is a skill upgradation. These are what we are saying, simple skills building, so many problems we can sort it out, but that also is a problem in developing countries. Even there is a vast di differentiation Mr. Bruce, as you rightly mentioned in one of your conference, that is the Budapest conference, you made it very clear. Inter-academy center has to be proposed so that the bridge between rich and poor nations, developing nations, and also within the nation, rich and poor, how to bridge this gap. This is the biggest challenge for all of us. Even if you see IPR, this is one area everybody has to think over. All developed nations are very rich in knowledge, science, technology. Thereby, you are having control on IPR. For every product, there is a cost price and also IPR price. Now we have to think more and more IPR, because of that, more and more companies are having monopoly on knowledge. Then naturally, you are depriving this knowledge or science and technology for the developing countries. Is there any way? to treat developing countries differently. So this, this knowledge and technology will reach them, so that this bridge will be further narrowed. I think we all know the figures, but they kind of bear repeating. 1.2 billion on less than a dollar a day, 3 billion on less than $2 a day. And attached with that is an enormously useful population. Currently, the United States is exactly twice the size of Pakistan. 282 million to 141. But Pakistan has more under 18-year-olds than the United States, 75 to 71 million. That enormous group of young people is coming into a schooling system which is already bursting at the seams and is unable actually to provide the kind of quality education that will be necessary for science to take root and for the preparation of a future generation across the board, I'm not talking about pockets of excellence, across the board to deal with the challenges of the knowledge-based economy of the future that globalization is actually driving very quickly. There is a fundamental issue, which is the issue of copyright on information. And today we have the tools to create the digital libraries of tomorrow. In other words, a total scientific library that is put online and is available to research scientists in developing countries everywhere. We need to overcome some obstacles in that, but I believe that this is feasible. And that's one of the reasons why I remain an optimist, because these then will make available, almost in real time, the best knowledge uh, uh, and create libraries that uh, developing countries can only dream about. And that's how you will strengthen those institutions in many developing countries. Science itself, the knowledge is morally neutral. The second law of thermodynamics the fact that HIV causes AIDS, these are morally neutral statements. But the knowledge is a two-edged sword. The understanding of nuclear fission can be used for nuclear energy, or it can be used to make weapons. 
our understanding of disease processes from the molecular to the population level aspects of it can be used for public health or to design weapons of terror. And it's against that background that more and more we are seeing, and I welcome, awkward debates about what use we shall make of the knowledge. I say science and the young people who carry its values into society are our greatest hope, but we can do better still if we inculcate an ethos that these people must be citizen scientists and if we create effective mechanisms to debate the tomorrow we'll create with the possibilities they will offer us.